Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will recompense. And I tell you, this is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Some of you people are in grave danger. I wondered why he ever sent me back to this hall. He told me last night to go back and tell him this one thing, one time, once more. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It's interesting, isn't it, that a man doesn't go to hell for what he does. He goes to hell for what he does not do. He does not believe on Jesus. That's all. That's all. Every occupant of hell will be charged with the same crime, guilty of the same offense, sentenced to the same place. There won't be any cell blocks marked murderers. Won't be any over here for whoremongers. Won't be any over there for adulterers. Won't be any over there for profaners. Won't be any over there for drunkards. You know, they segregate you in prison some way, but not there. You just all go in one big bullpen, and they're all marked lost because they refuse to believe God's testimony, because they called God a liar when he said that he was satisfied with the blood of Jesus Christ, and that was enough to make every man in that place righteous. That's how much God loves the human race, and that's how badly he wants to save them. And that's how, what length he went to to get it done, he emptied heaven and killed himself. That he might bring all under universal condemnation, and at the same time bring them all to a universal salvation by grace. I tell you, God's interested in one thing. What have you really believed about the gospel? What do you really believe? Okay, now. See, I've been gone for two or three weeks, so we get a long message this morning. The second thing the Holy Spirit talks to the unsaved man about is righteousness. Sin the sin of not believing on him. And the second subject is righteousness, which is only a part of the first subject. But he does not talk to the unsaved about his lack of righteousness. And he does not talk to the unsaved about how to establish that righteousness. He does not talk to the unsaved about how to be more righteous than he is now. He talks to him about Christ, his only righteousness, his only hope of righteousness, and a righteousness which can be his freely by simply receiving it by grace from the hand of God. Of righteousness because I go to my Father. What's that mean? It means this. When he left this earth to go to his Father, how did he go? My God, my God, why hast thou what? Forsaken me. When he left this world, he left forsaken of God. Why was he forsaken of God? Because God made him to be sin for you. Because he bore your sins in his own body while on that tree. And when he expired, bearing those sins in his own body, sin passed upon his soul. And he plunged himself into hell by his own hand. But here speaking prophetically, he said what he knew in his heart. That God would not leave his soul in hell, nor suffer his Holy One to see corruption. I will go to my Father, he said, and when I arrive at my Father's presence, you will know it, because I will pray him, and the Holy Spirit will come, and he will testify that I'm there. And if he comes and testifies that I am there, this is what it means. I am there because God has accepted me in your behalf, and now I am your righteousness in the sight of God, standing there for all eternity. That's the gospel I'm preaching to you. Do you hear me, you people? 
getting agitated with some of you. You're like Israel. You listen, but you don't hear. You see, but you don't perceive. The Holy Spirit graciously speaks to you and you harden your stubborn, rebellious, religious hearts because you love your darkness better than light. He doesn't talk to the unsaved about getting righteous. He doesn't talk to the unsaved about how to be more righteous today than we were yesterday. He doesn't talk to the unsaved about their lack of righteousness, how they fail to come up to the righteousness of God, and therefore they need to do something righteous so God will accept and approve them. No, that's what the lying demon spirits say. This is what the Spirit of God says. You are unrighteous. You could not in a million years establish your righteousness in the sight of God, and I will not help you do it, the Holy Spirit testifies. For your righteousness has already been established in the sight of God, already set down at the right hand of God. That righteousness is a person. It's Jesus Christ. And if you don't have Him, you will die unrighteous and go to hell. That's what He testifies about. Of righteousness because I go to my Father. And He testifies of judgment. But he doesn't talk to the unsaved about the great white throne, and he doesn't talk to them about the books that shall be opened. And he doesn't talk to them about a stern God sitting on the seat of judgment and saying, Separate from me into everlasting darkness. The Holy Spirit never convicts the unsaved of the great day of judgment. His testimony is to one effect. The day of judgment is already past for those who have believed. The day of judgment is not out in the future. It's 1,900 years in the past. Jesus went to judgment for you. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. This signifying what death he should die. And when he was raised on the cross of Calvary between heaven and earth, and he cried, I'm forsaken of God. I'm a worm. I'm lost and I'm perishing under the sins of the world. What was he doing? He had drawn the whole human race to himself, identified the whole family of Adam with himself, took their place as the representative head of that family, the Son of Man, and died in the place and in the stead of every human being who ever lived and ever will live. And when God sat down in judgment, he sat down at Calvary, and he spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. Oh, my dear friends, the Holy Spirit, when he testifies, testifies not look forward to a coming day of judgment. Look backward to a day that's already passed. Look backward to the day when you appeared in judgment in the person of Christ and God sentenced you and sent you to hell and banished you from his presence. But praise God, raised you when he raised his son and received you to glory and seated you in perfect righteousness forever and ever. That's the good news of the gospel. Shoot, that is good news. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, shall never come into judgment. He's passed from death unto life. Is passed from death unto life. Nothing to judge. What's to be judged for him who believes God about Jesus? Who's to condemn when Christ has already died for me and God has already justified me? See the power of faith? And you see why it's good news? Let me just speak briefly to you about His ministry among the saints. I have to throw this in. You know, the plan of salvation is so wonderful, so beautiful. Pardon me. And the way of salvation is so simple. Wayfaring man, though a fool, couldn't miss the way if he wanted to find it. So simple. Read First John chapter 5 and see that John testifies 
that man is saved by believing the record which God has given of his Son, and this is the record that God hath given unto the eternal life, and his life is in his Son. And he that believes on the Son has life, and he that believes not has not life. He's made God a liar. He's denied his testimony. He's committed the only sin for which he will perish. So simple. Do you know what I believe? <laughs> As if you didn't know. I believe Jesus was God. And I believe that Jesus came down here on this earth. That God visited down here in human form and tabernacled among other human beings and disguised himself and called himself more than 80 times the Son of Man. I believe this God so loved me. Nobody discovered God. Nobody pried him out of hiding. Nobody stepped over the stars and the moon and the planets and jerked him off his chair and brought him down to earth. He did this on his own. He came out of his own hiding place and revealed himself because the scripture says he loved me. I'll tell you what I believe. This God who is there, this God who is real, this God I know, this God who lives in me, he came from glory. By the way of Bethlehem's manger, born of a virgin, walked among men for 33 years to settle forever in my heart any fear or any doubt that he may not be truly man as he was truly God. And at the end of 33 years, this precious God said the only way to bring me to himself was to take my place and to receive himself the punishment he had set aside for me to bear himself the wrath that was due to me by nature. And he ascending to the cross of Calvary, the most glorious stage of all earth's history, he died. I mean to impress that upon you. Nobody killed him. God himself couldn't have killed him. Man couldn't kill him. The Jews didn't kill him. Romans didn't kill him. The spear didn't kill him. The nails didn't kill him. The lash didn't kill him. I'll tell you how he died and why he died. He willfully dismissed his own spirit. He willed himself to death for me. I believe that when he died, he acted in my place, in my stead, a substitute. I believe that when he hung between heaven and earth, it was me appearing at the judgment of God. I believe that when God looked upon him, he looked upon him as though he were looking upon me. And when God saw him, he saw my sin, and he saw my sins, and he banished him from his presence. And the Savior cried, I am forsaken, I am forsaken, I'm a worm, God help me. And I believe that he went to hell, where I would go if there was no Jesus. And I believe that God raised him from among those who were spiritually dead that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And I believe that he crossed the great gulf into paradise and announced the good news of his finished work. And I believe that when he ascended to the glory, God opened the throne room of heaven, received him to his right hand, and said, You are my beloved son. This day have I begotten thee, born again, my brethren. You hear me? The firstborn among many brethren, the author and finisher of our own faith and the captain of our own salvation. And when God said, You're my beloved son, this day have I begotten thee. Sit here at my right hand. I believe that when he did that, he opened heaven to me and he seated me there. And if Jesus is there, I'm as sure of being in that place as though I've been there a million years already. You know why I believe all that stuff? Because God says so. A million men have told me a million different ways. But the Holy Spirit told me that was the way in. And I believed him. You say, well, you won't know until you die. Oh, nuts. I know now. Well, how do you know now? Because he lives in me and he's real. I know him, I can hear him, I can see him, he dwells in me. How about you? You may not like me. 
You may not like the way I look. You may not like the way I act. You may not like the way I talk. The one thing you can't do, you can't do nothing with that testimony. There just may be one shot in a million, I'm telling you the truth. And if I am and you ain't got what I got, you're in trouble. So if you got it, you know, you ain't going to begrudge me having it, are you? And if you don't have it, it's you that's worried, not me. Because <laughs> I'm not worried. Now, I want to talk to you briefly. Have we filled up one tape yet? Okay, good. Huh? To fill up two? Oh, okay. we got all kinds of tape. Now, let me talk to you for just a few minutes about his ministry with the saints. But you know when I, th I can't get to that yet. But when I think of the simplicity of salvation, <laughs> it blesses my heart. It's so simple, isn't it? Only believe. Do you know of anything else to do? What can you do? It's all been done. What's to do? Can you descend into hell? Paul argues in Romans 10, Jesus has already done it. Can you ascend into the glory? He's already done that. And if you were already in heaven, could you come down from heaven to earth and do this for somebody else? No, he's already done it. What can you do then, Paul says, he can do this. The word of faith is as near as your very heart you can believe. <laughs> Just believe that it's finished. And have a little rest, a little peace down inside about your sin and sins. Just set to your seal that God's true. And after all, it was his deal, wasn't mine. That's the best deal I've made in my life. I made some good deals, but that was a doozy. <laughs> going down the highway the other day, you, you think all I do is go down the highway. <laughs> and that's about right. You either go down or up. Now I'm driving along, and I've got the radio on, and I hear the news commentator, and he says, the world has gone into shock and into mourning because the king is dead. And I thought, my God, nobody told me. You know, I mean, I mean, what's the use of preaching when the king's dead? And so I'm listening because I don't know who the king is, you know. I, I knew England didn't have any kings. England don't have any kings. So we don't have any king here. Who's the king? So I'm listening. Elvis Presley. I said, Elvis Presley, the king? And the king is dead. Then he went on and told about all the mourning that was going on across the country and how thousands and thousands of people had gathered out in the street in front of his mansion and, and were weeping and sobbing and passing out and... 40, 50 different people laying along. One, one reporter says it looks like a battlefield. I counted 40 bodies prostrate in the street waiting for ambulances to come and get them. Women screaming hysterically, Elvis, Elvis, why did you leave us? Why did you leave us? The king is dead. And for days, that's all I heard. But the sudden, tragic, shocking news that Elvis Presley died. I expected Elvis Presley to die. I expect Jimmy Carter to die and believe it or not even though he may not Richard Nixon will die it is a point on all men want, wants to die it's in the cards it's a divine appointment Elvis died because he's just like me made out of flesh and bone and I thought my heart got sad wouldn't it be wonderful if I could turn on the radio and hear everybody in the United States talking about the death of Jesus? Saying the king is dead. But not mourning, but rejoicing in the streets. I'm glad the king died. Long live the Savior. The king died. The king belonged to Israel, you know. The king died that the Savior might live. The king died that I might live. I'm glad the king died. I'm glad they buried him. And I want to tell you, they didn't put him in any marble mausoleum like they did Elvis. And nobody came around by the thousands, the scores of thousands, to pick the flowers off his grave. But I want to tell you something. I'm glad he died, and I'm glad he was buried. And I'm also glad he did something Elvis can't do. He came back from where he went. 
Boy, I was going along there thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody could talk about Jesus' death? Like they're talking about Elvis. And then a little bit I heard this statement made. Interview with Pat Boone. Pat Boone said that he was glad Elvis died a Christian. And I, I thought, what? This world is going crazy. And Pat went on to say how Elvis had been a Christian and his manager testified that he had locked himself up in his room for days and days and days and studied the Bible. And you know the first thought that came out of my heart? Man alive, just as soon as a guy dies, everybody sings him right into heaven. Now suddenly he's a saint just as soon as he dies. And that's wrong. Then the Holy Spirit reminded me, he said, Oh, is it? Why are you so shocked at the idea of us might be in heaven? I said, well. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know. Just, you know, I hate to think i got to listen to that old, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care if Glenn Miller was there, but I don't, I don't like the thoughts of Elvis being up there, you know. I mean, can you hear Elvis on that harp? <laughs> I mean, that'd be something else, wouldn't it? So he said, why are you so shocked at the thought of Elvis being up there? And I said, well, I just, you know, I just never thought of him as being a Christian. And the Lord said to me, do you really believe the gospel you preach? I said, Lord, you know I believe that gospel. What does a man have to do to be saved? Look like a Christian? What's a man have to do to be saved? Act like the churches say a Christian ought to act? What's a man have to do in order to be saved? And I said, Lord, he has to believe that Jesus died for his sins and that he was buried and raised again the third day, according to the Scripture. And he said, and do you believe that salvation is all of grace? And I said, yes, Lord. Then won't you concede the point that maybe grace could have reached a man like Elvis Presley? Don't you think Elvis Presley could have believed just like you believed? And then he reminded me of something I didn't like too well. He said, you know, Herbie, if you die today and they print your obituary in the Parkersburg News, there's going to be an awful lot of people who say, if he's in heaven, we're all going to be there. Because you don't look like a Christian to an awful lot of people. And you don't act like a Christian in the eyes of an awful lot of people who have their own standards of what a Christian ought to do and be and think and say. But are you a Christian? I said, yes, Lord. Well, I want you to just quit worrying about Elvis. And know this for sure, that he is exactly where he wanted to be. And you know, I wouldn't be a bit mad if I got up there and he was there. You know what I'm saying? I'm do, you know, what I'm doing is plumbing the depths of our religious hearts a little bit. Okay? I mean, very few Christians found any place in heaven for Elvis Presley. Right? Uh-huh. They, they figured out pretty quick where he went. Yet they turn right around and preach salvation is by grace alone without any works and it's for sinners. And Elvis ain't a sinner, then there ain't none of the sinners. He can believe if he wants to believe. He can be saved as simply as I was saved and as simply as you're saved. And oh, my brethren, who knows what goes on in the deep inner recesses of a man's soul when he's alone in the night seasons with nobody but him and God. Elvis put his pants on in the morning just like I put mine on. They didn't they don't fit him like mine fit me, but you know what I mean? He was a man. And there were night seasons when he was alone with God, just God and Elvis. You believe that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What was his reputation, the loneliest man on earth? Why was he lonely? Because he never knew the friend that you and I know. That's why. Okay. Quickly, and I close. The Holy Spirit's ministry to the saints. Verse 12. I, Jesus, have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Let me just give you a comment on that. There is a divine season for the revelation of truth to the saints. Isn't that precious? Oh, we wonder sometimes why we can't 
get a hold of or understand some great, deep, mysterious truth, it's because we couldn't bear it. He says, I have many things I'm going to say to you. You can't bear them right now. But he indicated there would be a time when they would be able to bear them. Fruit is seasonable. And so is the revelation of truth seasonable. And when you can't lay hold of some truth that somebody else is rejoicing in, just say it's not the season for me. And one day there will come a time when Jesus will reveal that precious truth to you. Notice in verse 13, when the Holy Spirit comes, listen, he will guide you into all the truth. He will guide you into all the truth. Jesus lives in me by his Holy Spirit. One of his chief ministries in me is to reveal more and more and more of the truth that he is to me. A personal revelation from the Lord Jesus to me of himself. And I've been asked 1,000 times, give or take a few, in the ministry, well, if Jesus personally reveals the truth to you, will he ever reveal anything contradictory to the Bible? I'm going to answer that for you. He will never reveal anything in contradiction to the written Scriptures. Never. Any revelation that comes will verify the written Scriptures. Any revelation that denies the inspired testimony of God's Word, the written Word which I have here before me, does not come from the Holy Spirit of God. It comes from another Spirit. that satisfy you? Oh, there's one little thing. The revelation of the Lord Jesus of truth to me has over and over and over contradicted my interpretation of the Bible. Think about it. That's where the problem is. Here's somebody saying that the Lord revealed something to him, you know, and I hear some other saints saying, but that's in contradiction with the Bible. Oh, is it? Are you the Bible? Listen, do you know what this book is laying in front of me on this desk? It is a book made of leather, paper, and black ink. It has words on it. Do you know what these words say? They say anything anybody wants them to say that reads them. Do you grant that? Yes. Let me hear it again. Yes. A million people read this book and they read a million things. It reads like anybody wants it to read. And the Scriptures testify that the Spirit of truth is the only one who knows what those words mean. And he's the only one who can interpret those words to our hearts. He's the only one who can guide us into the truth of what is written on this white paper in this leather book. I believe that. And I want to tell you more than one time, the Holy Spirit and I have faced off one on one. And I was accusing him of contradicting the written word he gave. And I was saying, wait a minute, you keep telling me that in my heart, but that can't be true because it says right here, book, chapter, and verse. And the Holy Spirit is so patient. Jesus is so patient. And eventually he say, when I quit screaming long enough, okay, granted that that's what you think it says, go back and read it again and see if that's what really it says. You with me? Read 1 Corinthians 2 when you go home if you have any problems with this. And you will see that by the spirit of man, man can only understand the things of man. And by the spirit of God, spiritual things are made understandable to him. And he discerns them by the spirit of God. And they are revealed to him by the spirit of God. The deep, unfathomable, unsearchable things of God are revealed to it. The unfathomable, unsearchable things are not spelled out in black and white in this book. They are couched in the language of this book and revealed to the heart by the Holy Spirit of God. You say, well, and the words don't mean anything. They don't mean a thing without the Holy Spirit. Not a thing. Not a thing on earth. 
And if you think they do mean anything, tote your Bible around to the 150 churches in this town and ask them all for their interpretation of one single verse and see what you come up with. Doesn't mean a thing. He will guide you. He will guide you into all truth. Oh, he's precious to do that. And you know, it isn't because the Bible is written in, in, in uh, difficult language. The English is beautiful, and anybody who can read English can certainly understand what's written there. Why is it then we have so many understandings of what's written there? It isn't because the Holy Spirit used bad grammar, and it isn't because... You know, he could not enunciate or whatever. It was not because he failed to clarify himself when he wrote the Scriptures. It is because of the blindness that is upon our hearts, the hardness that is upon our hearts, and the gross ignorance that is upon our heart of spiritual things. So when we read, we have to say, Lord, I know what the words say. What does it mean? And the Holy Spirit guides us into all the truth. Oh, I love that. And the word guide, I've told you before, is only used in two other places. Once when the eunuch said to Philip, how can I understand except some man guide me? Isn't that precious? Hear me? Eunuch, up in a chair. What was he doing? Reading the Bible. Why didn't he understand it? Because he needed the Holy Spirit to guide him. Well, the dummy, he was educated. He was a treasure of all Ethiopia. The man was cultured, intellectual. And he's sitting there reading the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Why can't he understand what's written on that page? He doesn't understand it because he doesn't have any light. He doesn't understand it because he can't understand the things of God. He can't understand it because he has only the spirit of man, and the spirit of man can only understand the things of man. And so he said to Philip, I don't know what I'm reading. I read the words, but I don't understand them. I need somebody to guide me. He asked for a man because he didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. But it was the Spirit that wakened Philip at Samaria and said, Go. And Philip got up and he opened the Scriptures at the same place. Listen. The very words that the eunuch had just read and couldn't make heads or tails of them. And Philip opened his mouth and preached unto him Jesus. And you know, every time after that, when the eunuch opened up Isaiah and he saw that passage, he said, Praise God, that's Jesus. I understand that the Holy Spirit revealed to my heart that there was Jesus there on that page. Are right, you following me? Now take the eunuch and he tucks his scroll under his arm and he goes back up to Jerusalem to share this with his Jewish friends. He goes, Hi there! Boy, did I ever learn some on my way down home last week. What'd you learn? Well, open your Bibles with me. I want to share it with you. Open up here to Isaiah 53. Said, so, you know this passage? Remember when I left Jerusalem, we was having a big discussion over this? And there wasn't any of us to make heads or tails of it? I got the answer. What is it? It's Jesus. Jesus? That's blasphemy. That's false doctrine. You're a heretic. Call the elders. Put this man out of the church. He's teaching doctrine that's never been taught here before. He says, Lord, reveal that to him. That's in contradiction to the Scriptures. No, no, it was in contradiction to their interpretation of the Scriptures. That's a horse of another color. Remember that, will you? Just, that ain't going to cost you dimes more, and that's free. But you remember that. Next time you accuse people of being uh, heretics and blasphemers, you know, and perverters of the Scripture and bending the Word all out of shape and getting revelations contradictory to the Word of God, you meditate on that, will you, in the night season? Then maybe you're reading black words on white paper, but maybe you don't understand what you read. Now, Jesus sent me here to tell you that. That ain't going to cost you anything. And in verse 13... The Spirit of Truth, when He has come, He will guide you into all truth. That same word is used of Judas, was guide to them that took Jesus. How did He guide them? He kissed Jesus. That was the mark of His ministry. He kissed Him. It's become a proverb with us. A Judas kiss. 
the same word used to describe the precious ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I have to pass it on to you. Whenever he reveals the truth to you, he'll kiss him. He'll make you love him as he loves him. Verse 13 says, He shall not speak of himself. That means he shall not speak out of a source from himself. The Holy Spirit is not some independent, separate revelation of truth from Jesus. Here is what the Holy Spirit says to us. He tells us only what he hears Jesus say. Read it there in that passage. Just as the Son only spoke while on the earth what he heard his Father say, he only passed on what he heard from his Father. The Holy Spirit will never give you any of his own words. He will always pass on to you exactly what Jesus says. And here's another part of his ministry. It will always glorify the Lord Jesus. That's the acid test of any doctrine. Does it glorify man or does it glorify Jesus? Does it exalt the Lord Jesus, make him bigger, more precious in your eyes? Or does it exalt man? Does, does it make his work bigger or does it make my work bigger? Does it make his righteousness more precious or does it make my righteousness more precious? Does it make him smarter or me smarter? What kind of a revelation is it? Does it glorify Jesus? If it doesn't glorify Jesus... It doesn't come from Jesus. It doesn't come from the Holy Spirit. He glorifies the Lord Jesus and every doctrine he preaches and every revelation he gives will do nothing more than magnify the finished work of the Lord Jesus, exalt the righteousness that Christ is, and praise God for the judgment that's already passed. That's what that doctrine will do, and that's what that revelation will give you. He will take all the things that belong to Jesus, and he will show them to you. And I close with some negatives. The Holy Spirit will never, never, never convict the saint of sin, sins, or sin. You hear me? He will never convict the saints of sins, for they were buried with the Lord Jesus. Their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more against them. Isn't it wonderful? Holy Spirit, talk to me about my sins. I would, but I can't remember them. Well, unfortunately, I still remember them, and unfortunately, I still remind him of them. But fortunately, he never discusses them with me. He acts as though he never hears me. And whenever I get my head on straight again, I find out he's turned me around and made me look at the cross again and say, what am I talking about? That's why he died. That's what he died for, my sins. The Holy Spirit will never discuss sins with you. He will never discuss the sin nature with you. And he will never convict you of the sin of not believing on Jesus if you have truly believed. Because he can't. There's nothing to convict you of. Nothing to convict you of. Second... The Holy Spirit will never convict the saint of his lack of righteousness, nor will he ever assist the saint in establishing his own righteousness in the sight of man or God. And last, the Holy Spirit will never bring judgment on any saint of God. He will never threaten judgment. He will never bring condemnation or threaten condemnation. He will never bring punishment nor threaten punishment to the saved of God. For judgment is already passed and there is now therefore but one testimony from the Holy Spirit and he says it so softly, no condemnation, no condemnation. For the Son of Man came not into this world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Saved from what? More than hell, my brothers. Saved from guilt. Saved from condemnation and its awful results. Saved from damnation and condemnation and judgment and the awful guilt and fear that it brings. Delivered from it and from the wrath to come. 
and the Holy Spirit, much to the contrary of my evangelical brothers who continually whip their congregations in line by threatening judgment at the judgment seat of Christ or threatening judgment while on this earth in the form of chastisement, which is just another word for punishment in the evangelical jargon of today. It's a Protestant purgatory where we must pay for our sins. Now, you know, it's a mystery to me, and I'm going to close, because someday we'll preach on that subject. It's a mystery to me how evangelical Christianity preaches that God moved heaven and earth to save the sinner, and once he gets him saved, he moves heaven and earth to destroy him. Isn't that right? That's a summary of religion. Moves heaven and earth to save him, and once he gets him saved, moves heaven and earth to destroy him. I heard a Christian not long ago speaking of another Christian and making comment of their sins. said, well, just give them time and God will give them what's coming to them. You know my response? I hope that just slipped out. Because if it didn't, you don't believe nothing. Nothing. In you, T-H-I-N, nothing. Lord bless you.